All right, guys, here's another episode of the Daily CDs. I'd like to take this time to thank all the people who've joined my Patreon. I really appreciate that. And then also the guys who have joined the, my membership on my YouTube channel. Uh, all that really helps a lot. And also to uh, Value Pack, dog food. You know, I fed Value Pack before. I really thought it was good dog food. The hounds did really good on it. And uh, I'll be feeding it again here soon. Uh, I think it's really important that we support the companies that support what we do. Also to W Supply. Uh, they provide this platform for us to share our content. And uh, I want to thank them for that. Anyway, here's that episode. Enjoy. Well, now this hunt took place, oh, I don't remember, but uh, I believe it is some, it is sometimes between, uh, between uh, I'd say 41, 42, maybe 43, somewhere around in there. Now, our clients was Frederick Prince and his partner, and I've forgotten his partner's name. Now, and I'll tell you who this Frederick Prince was. Now, he was a brother to Norman Prince. And Norman Prince is the pilot that was responsible for forming the Lafayette Escadrille of World War I. Now, a bunch of these pilots went over there and was before the United States ever got into the war. And they formed uh, brigade or something and called it the Lafayette Escadrille. <clears throat> now this Frederick Prince was a pilot over there too but he he got hurt and came back home and his brother stayed over there and was one of the main pilots in that Lafayette Escadrille and nearly all of them before the war was finally over Almost all of those pilots was killed, and Norman Prince was killed over there in Europe. <clears throat> and anyway, well, I don't know where it is now, but he, uh, this Frederick Prince, brought us a, a book on that La Lafayette Escadrille, and uh, he was in the book. But his brother was the main, was the main, you'd say, I guess, hero. And it was an interesting book, but that's been many years ago, and I don't know ever whatever went with the book, and I don't remember the name of the book for sure. But anyway, well, then he was a man fairly well up in years, and we were in some big rugged mountains uh, in in Sinaloa, Mexico, and uh, they're they're rugged. Well, anyway, we had hunted a, a day or two, and they were tired, so they didn't want to go out. So Clell and I decided we'd go out and uh, see what we could find. <clears throat> now, Clell and one lady went on one side of a <clears throat> of a great big canyon. I mean, it is deep and lots of bluffs and rugged. And another native and I went on the other. Well, I think Clell and his partner started out from camp afoot. Well, this other boy and I was going to make a lot the bigger circle, so we rode our mules ways to where we was going to try to go off in there and so by the bluffs we got down and tied our mules. And we started out. Well, we were going to meet down in this canyon. And we didn't know the country. The natives did, but they didn't tell us that you couldn't navigate that canyon at all. So we rimmed down the, well, as we was going down the creek, we rimmed down the right-hand side and Clell rimmed down the left-hand side. Well, we, when we hit the bottom of the creek down there where we were going to meet somewhere in that creek, well, you couldn't go up the creek on account of the bluffs and all. So this old boy and I decided we would go a little farther look around. Well, here come a little canyon into this big main canyon. Then from the other side, and that was right there where three forks of the, this canyon was. The main canyon, 
the canyon we'd come out of and then the other canyon from the other side. And right here was a, a buck deer killed by a jaguar. Well, our dogs picked it up right there. Well, now we had five hounds and two Warher Terriers for fighting dogs. And away they went right up this little canyon. And of course, it was rough and bluffy and everything else. And we heard them jump right in that canyon, quite a ways above us. And then these hounds went to bed. So, of course, we hurried up there as fast as we could. And right there at the foot of a, of a bluff, looking right up this canyon, little canyon, just a sitting there looking up this rock, or trying to get up, was these two wire-haired terriers. And we could hear these hounds bayed right on above us. So we scrambled around and finally got up there. And when we did, well, here was just a, a level place in under this ledge. And these hounds is on top. Well, right back under a shelving rock there, set this big jaguar. And I mean, he was, he was a good big specimen. Well, we weren't over. I imagine 30 feet from it. And I whispered to that native, I said, I'm going to walk right straight towards him and see see what that thing's going to do. So I just started walking right slow towards him and, and uh, had this old 30-30 and I, I loaded it right easy and let the hammer down. And this native walked along right just, just to the back behind me a little bit with his hand on my shoulder. And he kept whispering to me, quit out, quit out. That means look out, look out. And that thing just sat there and looked at us for a little while. But when he's always coming towards him, now in a minute he just gives it me is sitting down just like a dog. Well, now in a minute he started to kind of raising up with his back end and he started the, that tail to twitching going around and around the end of his tail and he started just slowly to lay his ears back on his head well that means they're getting ready to charge you and I knew that so I just stopped and all right now that Mexican was pretty leery because he just kept a whispering tweet out, tweet out well, instead of turning, I wasn't going to turn my back on that thing. So I just backed up right slow. And when he saw what, uh, that we were not going to come up any closer, well, he sat back down. So then we went around and and got up some ledges and got up to where our, our hound was obeying. And we saw the reason they were doing that. Now, here was a big hole that went right down to where the Jaguar was, which is probably 15 feet below us, down through that hole, maybe maybe 18. <clears throat> and the dogs is winding that Jaguar up through that hole. And, I, and I'm sure the Jaguar went in up where the hounds was, but they knew he was there. And so then I sent the native back to get those two wire hair terriers and he brought them up there and we tied the five hounds and these two wire hair terriers. So then I told him, I said, well, now listen, I'm going to hold this thing until you go, if I can, until you go back to camp and get Clell and some of the rest of them and know them. At least one of those hunters or both of them. And that was getting along pretty late in the afternoon. Well, I said, now I'm going to, uh, I can't do it in him on that ledge because he can come out anytime during the night and I don't want to run him fooling around here with him at night. But I did have a flashlight. I always carried a flashlight there. So, I just walked over to that and took up a good big rock <clears throat> and I just throwed her down through there 
And then I grabbed another right quick and rolled it. And all I mean, it made a roar noise and thundered up, bouncing from side to side on them rocks. <clears throat> and this old boy said to me, here he comes. Well, I run out there to look off, see which way he went. And he just ducked right back. And he said, he went back. So I grabbed me a big rock and run over there and looked down that hole. And there that jaguar was uh, looking up. He figured on coming out above. Well, when he did, I just throwed that rock at him. And it said, go walk. And he had a rock right in, right in front of him and just clattered like a rifle shot almost. And bounced. I don't think the rock hit the jaguar, but he sure did suck her back. <clears throat> then I grabbed several more big rocks and rolled down through there, and nothing happened. And I told this native, I said, well, he's come out. He said, no, he hasn't. I said, I know good and well he has. I said, that thing couldn't stand all that noise. He said, but that jaguar couldn't have come out of there without me of seeing him. I said, well, he has. He said, no, I don't think so. So I rolled a few more rocks. Nothing happened. So I told him, I said, let's go down there and look. So we went down there and looked and looked in there and there wasn't no jaguar. And I even took a stick and poked all around. And there wasn't some crevices there. And I knew the jaguar wasn't there. So we hurried back up on the up above there and we had to turn those hounds loose and get after him. So we turned all those dogs up, uh, loose right quick. And I run around the edge of that ledge there and stick them and they knew he'd come out. Them dogs had been a bawling and a barking all the time anyway. And away they went. <clears throat> well, I don't imagine they run him over 15 minutes and, and around on this hillside and just up on a, a little bluff that is probably 15 feet high, but you could kind of ledge you not right straight up and down. And in a tree that kind of stuck out over this ledge, they treed this thing. So we went around there and I looked at him. And I imagine then it was a, probably an hour and a half till it'd be dark. And I told him, I said, now you get going and you go fast as you can to that camp. And it's going to be way in the night and you get there. Will you get them right up and get them started and tell them all what's happened and that I'm keeping this Jaguar up this tree tonight? And that old boy said, they called me Felipe down there. That means Philip in English. He said, Felipe, he said, that Jaguar will eat you up tonight. I said, no, he won't. I said, I've got my gun here with me. That's what. I don't intend for him to eat me up. He said, Felipe, but I don't want to leave you here all night with that thing by yourself. I said, you go right ahead. I'll be all right. But you come on back as fast as you can. So I made him and he left there. And what I mean, now that Mexican had lots of stamina. So <clears throat> I went to gathering wood. And finally, instead of carrying this old rifle with me all everywhere, well, I kind of set her down and leaned her up against the rock right on top of this ledge. <clears throat> and I was getting wood to build a fire right at the foot of that tree. So if he came down during the night, maybe I could hit him by firelight and it, and maybe he wouldn't come down because he had come right down into the fire. And oh boy, there was a lot of wood there and I was together and just as fast as I could because I knew it was going to take quite a lot to last all night. <clears throat> and just as it was uh, getting good and sundown and I <clears throat> had what I thought was my last load and I had a good pile of wood there. Well, just as I was putting this wood down, well, I heard these dogs, they were just sitting there barking tree, but they said, Wow! And I looked up and hear that thing come out of that tree. Well, I had to scramble to get to this gun. And now, mind you, that was an awful bad place there, too. And I finally got to my old gun. And I had 
cottages in the magazine, but none in the barrel. And when I got to that gun, that thing was on that ledge and had his ears laid back, and here he comes. And I just loaded that old gun as quick as I could. I could, didn't have time to put it up to my shoulder or nothing because in one jump he could have been on me. And I just poked that old gun out in front of me and by golly I pulled the trigger. And I was scared. Well, I didn't know why it hit him or anything else. But it knocked him off of that leg. And of course these dogs just piled off of our right after him. Well, I went up there and found the crack and I got down through this ledge and was trying to get down to the, the dogs and I met both of these wire herd terriers coming back. And one of them was a clawing at his mouth like he had his mouth hurt bad. And I would say, get him. And they'd jump up and down and say, woof, woof. But they wouldn't go. They stayed in behind. So I went down there and right in this <clears throat> narrow canyon where this thing had bayed and all this, I call it arrow weed. It grew up about twice as high as my head and it was jointed, kind of like bamboo, but it was only about the size of a small lead pencil. And it was thick. So I was, I wasn't going to try to hold that thing that night then, not it on the ground. I was going to kill it. So I went in there and now a minute, that thing is after those dogs and here they come and they were just, they were just shooting through that stuff. Well now listen folks, old Dale is pretty fleet footed himself right in them days and I turned around and those dogs and I both went out of there right in a wad. And what I, what I mean, I was knocking that stuff down as it went out. Well, I just run out about 10 feet from the edge of that grass in a wheel to kill him, because I was going to kill him. But he didn't come out to where I could see him. And out of the five hounds then, he had hurt one so bad that it wouldn't go in this grass after him. And it would hurt. So four of them went back in there. And two of them got below it and two of them above where he was bathed. So I eased in there and I eased it in above because you're better off to be above anything than you are below it if it's going to charge you. And I got right close to these two hounds that is above and the way they was acting, I knew that it was coming towards them because they kept backing up, giving ground, backing up, giving ground. And I just stood there and after a bit, those dogs was right there to where they was hitting my legs with their tails as they was a barking and a baying. And I didn't know what part of him it was, but now in a minute through that stuff, I saw a patch of that jaguar and it was a, probably, oh, half as big as a baseball, just a circle. And I didn't know what part of him or anything. I was going to put a bullet just in any part of him I could get to. So I raised that old gun up and I pulled the trigger and he fell. <clears throat> well, I went in there to see where he was hit and he is hit right square in the middle of the neck. And he was a dying, but he is still a squirming around, kicking around a little bit. These two wire haired terriers run in there after that gun had went off and they run up to him and he kind of tossed his head around and they screamed and broke the run and turned and one of them hit me on the leg is I had most weight on it and no bigger than he was he nearly knocked me down. Well now I made up my mind right then and I give him a severe sentence. I said uh uh Jerry and Jeff was these little warriors' names. I said, now listen, little dogs. I said, I've raised you from a little pup and I've pampered and petted you and, and done the best I could. And you've always had everything you wanted to eat. And you did do real good fighting on bear. But when you got up against the Jaguars, you showed a, a 
a yellow feather. And I never thought there was an animal on earth that could scare you two little dogs. But you whipped out on that jaguar. So I am giving you a severe sentence. I'm going to leave you in Mexico for the rest of your life because I'm going to give you to some of these Mexicans down here. Well, I've done that. Well, Jeff got a fine home because Pancho Pereira uh, took him. And he had a fine home the rest of his life. And I give Jerry to another Mexican, and I don't know, I lost track of him, and I don't know whether he had a fine home the rest of his life or not. Well, uh, now this was in a thick place, but I had some rope around the waist. So I got the rope and pulled this thing downhill. I couldn't pull him very much uphill and pulled him out of that <clears throat> thicket, got him down ways in that canyon. And so I dreaded him and I built me a fire and got ready to stay there all night until they come the next, until they got there. I didn't know when they'd get there. Well, along towards morning, I heard them coming away down there. And uh, there were several of them, and of course, they were talking and fooling around, and I heard them. And after a while, uh, I heard this Mexican that had been with me, and he turned around and said to Pancho Ferreira, says, listen, says, there's something wrong. Because if those dogs were barking, from where I left them yesterday evening, we could hear them real plain because we're getting right close to, to there. And, uh, but they hadn't, they down a little bit and they hadn't seen my fire. And so I just hollered down to them. I said, well, come on up, boys. It's all over with. He's a laying here. So that Frederick Prince and his partner, they was with them. They came on up. And everybody is standing there looking at that Jaguar. And I said to Frederick Prince, that's going to be his. His partner had already got his and killed it. I said, well, now listen, Mr. Prince. I said, that thing came out of that tree just as it's getting dark last night. And he tried to catch me and was coming at me right on that ledge up there. And I said, I shot him off of it. And I didn't kill him. But I said, I knocked, I hit him and, and knocked him off. Now, you know, I, I had hit that thing <clears throat> in the back, but missed his spine, of course, and all. And that went in, that bullet went right on down into him. And that bullet never went through him from a 30 30. But naturally it hurt him, but the way he was maneuvering around down there and, a, and a slashing up them dogs and all, it wasn't stopping him too fast. So I said, well, now it was either he or I, and I was going to have it to be it, be the Tigre any time before I was going to let him get a hold of me. He said, well, Dale says that's a beautiful trophy, and I will certainly, I will certainly take that thing back home and mount it. And so, so we pulled it down the way to where we could get to it with a mule. And we put it on that mule and got on them and started back. Well, it took us till two o'clock that afternoon to get back to camp. So, of course, as soon as we got back to camp, while well, we skinned it and salted it and prepared the hide because it was a good one. And he is a good big one. Now, now this is kind of shows you the stamina of some of those mountain raised Mexican ball fellas down there. We had started out that morning and probably rode our mules uh, uh, an hour. And then we walked the rest of the day. And then that late that evening when I was going to hold the Jaguar up the tree, he started back to camp. And he walked just as fast as he could back to camp. And he had a light, but he's in the, in the dark and over rugged country. Well, he got to camp and he got them up just as fast as he could. 
And they started right back, right then, and him afoot. Well, they walked on back to the Jaguar again. And then after we loaded the Jaguar on the mule, he walked back to camp, and he didn't get back there until 2, two o'clock that afternoon. Well, now that would make him be a walking practically all the time, one day, one night, until 2 o'clock the next day. And so I call that stamina. Well, now the Lee brothers have been called upon to go track down these predatory killers all over different parts of the United States. And we've been contacted by foreign countries. Now they've got either an animal or some animals over in Australia. They're, they're killing thousands of dollars worth of sheep. Well, it couldn't be just one animal because uh, it's been killing in there too many years. Now they think it's an American cougar. Some of them do, the farmers and all do, and the, I mean the ranchers, and and lots of most of the people of Australia doesn't think that it is an American cougar. They think it's those dingo dogs. Well, they should be very familiar with the dingo dog because the dingo dog is really the only predator that they're supposed to have in Australia. But anyway, well, Cleo's brother-in-law that was married to Catherine, her, he married her sister. Now here 15 years ago or more now, he and his family, three children and his wife and him, uh, his name is Pat Cousin, they went over to Australia and they're still over there. And uh, this Pat Cullen has done lots of uh, he done some lion hunting and caught quite a few lions when he was uh, running that big ranch called the Babbitt Brothers. He ran it for years and he saved his money and that's when he got enough money to go to Australia and get started over there. Well, his uh, sons weren't too old when they went over there. I think, I think the girl was probably 18 and then uh, his oldest boy then was about 16 and the other one was about 14. Well, when he first got over there, well, he went to running a big ranch that reached over part of that desert. <clears throat> now there they called those ranches stations and this ranch was built on a wagon wheel in, in a circle. And it was 250 miles from the outside circle into the middle where the main station was. And they were with, would gather huge herds of cattle. And he was, uh, he was the cow boss and would bring, bring them into the main station to be sold. And he had his, and he and his wife and his daughter and two sons were on the payroll. He was running the outfit and his daughter and two sons were, were cowboys and his wife cooked. And so they done pretty good. And eventually then, why well, he bought a, a place there and, uh, and got some cattle, but there wasn't very much money in cattle. So he came, he, he ordered, I don't remember how many mares but quarter horse mares and a fine quarter horse stud and they had to be quarantined for six months and they had to go by the way of England to get them over there but anyway he got them over there and started to stand in this stud that stud and also then uh, raising out of these mares that he took over and he's doing real good now and making more. So 
all right. His oldest son then and another fellow were, was way down there looking over some country and they were at Perth, Australia. Well, that would be way in the south, I think, and the west. And this Perth is right on the coast. And it is a big city. Well, out from Perth was where this, uh, these animals were doing the killing that they thought was the American cougar. But they, it was funny, they had never been able to kill one. Supposedly, they'd been sighted quite a few times. And then these ranchers and the uh, Australian government, they really got to warring over that. Because the Australian government kept telling them there were no such animals. And these farmers knew there were. Well, when this oldest boy was down there, it should have been his daddy. Because I know he wasn't old enough to know very much about lions when he left here. But anyway, he went and looked at it and told us that he thought that it was a lion. <clears throat> but anyway, they got Cleo's address. So they wrote to him, I want to buy some dogs to catch that, those cougars, or that cougar. And for one cougar, if somebody would catch it, they was offering $20,000 reward. So uh, Robert McCurdy, the fellow that was the author of my book, he was come over there to see me about the book when this was right hot, and he got really interested in it. So he got to calling them fellas by phone and corresponding with them and told them that uh, we would come over there and uh, see and, and catch that thing, no matter what it was. And uh, it hasn't material, materialized yet, but now this has been going on now for two or three years. And last winter then in December, while we was out on the line hunt and uh, was way in the night and I laid down on some wet ground and I laid it to that and and caught pneumonia and I had had it before so I was really knocked out and I'm just now uh, getting back up on my feet but that is still in the makings and I think some time that I'll get to go to Australia to see about that animal. Now it's my idea rather than take a big expedition over there is to go over there and look first and be sure that it is a predator animal and then then take an expedition and go over after it. But the trouble of it is that they're wanting to quarantine my dogs for six months and I won't agree to that but they're trying to work it so we can go through Canada with our dogs and to go in there and save all that trouble of having them quarantined. Now, whether that can be pulled for sure or not, I don't know, because I'm not going to send those high-priced dogs, which I will take the best dogs I've got naturally over there and have them stand in a little old, in a little old pen for six months and never be out. <clears throat> because if you did that, your dogs would be in such a shape when you got them out, it would take a long time to get them back up on their feet to where they could really do the work. So maybe something will come come of that expedition, and I kind of think they will. So I'm kind of planning on in the future of not too long off of going to Australia and seeing about that. Well, this happened quite a number of years ago and I really don't <clears throat> remember just how many, but anyway, Clay was a, a work, still working for the old Biological Survey in in the state of New Mexico, and uh, and I was a guide. But anyway, well, this was kind of in the summertime, and that's when I'd be going over 
around in different parts of the mountains and working my hounds and sometimes uh, hunting for bounty. So he was camped on Diamond Creek. Now that's right back up in that area where a few years before that, that that fella had shot, had uh, shot our brother Arthur when we had that lime tree. So Vincent went with me. And we just going up there to work the dog some and to visit Clell for a few days. So landed there and then right over from a, a few miles from there, I don't remember how far, but it must have been 20, 30 miles by road, but probably 10 miles straight through by horseback was the Diamond Bar Ranch. And it was on Black Canyon that was one of the main canyons in that country. And it run into that Gila River of New Mexico. Set this big Diamond Bar Ranch. And we were then on the range of the Diamond Bars where they was running cattle. And the fellow that was running this ranch was named Homer Gaither. So he came to her camp and told me, said, well, now right in this area, there's a bear shows up in here every spring and says he is a stock killer and he has killed lots of stock and says, I want to tell you, he's been run by many packs of hounds and the hounds have never held him long enough for anybody to kill him, but says he has been shot. And they, and they know they was hit. And then they didn't get him. So if the right bear is gotten, well, he'll, he'll be shot somewhere. And he said, uh, and he's ranging right in this area, right here. And he's on this, on this, uh, he ranges a lot right in this canyon, higher up. And uh, that, the name of that canyon was, uh, was Middle Diamond. There was three forks there, East Diamond, Middle Diamond, and West Diamond. So he said, I'd like to get you, maybe if I can, to uh, help me get that bar. So he says, I can give you a small bounty. I can't give you no big bounty because that ranch wouldn't give me permission. But says, they should give you a real big bounty for that bar if you get him. So I said, all right. I said, come over. I said, go back to the ranch and come back in this afternoon. That is about noon, I imagine. He, I told him, I said, well, we'll try it in the morning. Oh, no, he, well, he said, I've got to go back to the ranch and, and tell them what I'm going to do there because says they wouldn't know what was wrong with me and start out looking for me. I said, well, go back and then come back this afternoon, stay all night, and we'll give him a trial. So he did. And this doesn't happen very often. We got up there the next morning, and they hit this pretty fresh bar track and just left there. And the doggone numb skulls was on the back end of it. Well, by the time we called him and got them all, three or four hours it elapsed. And he said, come on, let's go back to the other end of it and start it. Says, I'm sure we can catch him, uh, or we can jump him. And he said, I'm sure from the looks of the tracks that it's the bar that we want. And I said, now listen, Homer. I said, I'm not going to do that. I said, these dogs has already put up a long, hard race. <clears throat> And when you take them back then and put them on the other end of that track, I don't doubt for what they could jump in. But being as if that mean a bar, well, they'd have a lot of the zip took out of them by the time they'd get to him, and I'm not going to do it. Well, and now a lot of the, you hunters that think that a man that was a big game hunter and a man that anything, why would he hunt dogs that would do that. Well, now they don't do it on bar, but very seldom, but once in a while they do. And uh, 
if you people that think that, you never have hunted big game. So, I said, listen. I said, now, naturally, uh, knowing that I was putting them up against an extra mean bar, today I had the best bar pack that's down there. And Vincent and I had brought in uh, t- 20 hounds. And uh, 12 had 12 or 15 there. So that made a big pack. So I said, I'll tell you what you do. I said, you go on back to the diamond bars and day not tomorrow, but day after tomorrow evening and give these dogs two days rest. They were exercising hard. I said, you give them two days rest and come back and we'll give that big son of a gun if we can hit his tracks a go around. And he said, all right. So he did. And he came in that second day in the evening and we stayed all night and Vincent was kind of staying in camp or cooking for us and Clell was lying. So told Vincent, I said, well now, I want you to get us up in the morning in time for me to feed the her saddle animals and we want to roll out of here just as we can see these animals. He said, okay. Well, he got us up. And I went and fed the animals. And then we ate breakfast. And we sat there. And we sat there. I trying for it to start breaking day in the east. And we sat there. And I said, for goodness sake, Vincent, what time did you get us up? I said, we have fed the horses and we've ate breakfast. And here we're sitting here at the campfire. Well, he said, oh, I have to confess a little bit. He said, I, I looked at my watch a little wrong. He said, I got you up at two o'clock. Well, I said, I knew there was something wrong. Well, I fidgeted and I squirmed and I turned one side to the fire and then the other. And it wasn't real, it wasn't real cold either because was back high in the mountain, but it's in the summertime. I think it is June. And really, before we could see the dogs good, well, we had two black fighting dogs there. And mister, they were bar dogs when it comes to fighting. And they would go right on, they didn't cold trail, but they'd go right along with your hound and not bother a thing until you jump that bar and then they had built on him. So I necked them. I wanted to keep them all in there, especially. I wanted to keep real good track of them until I could see them good. So let's see. I turned loose 12. And these two fight dogs were two of the 12. And they were cold black. And I necked them together. And I turned the rest of them loose. And I was riding a little mule that I thought Budweiser, and he was a peart mule if there ever was one. So we hadn't rode any distance up this um, creek. We was on a government trail right up this main diamond. <clears throat> and I had a big red and white spotted dog that I called Ted. He, and he was, he was a bar dog. He was also a lion and jaguar dog. And I was making them all stay behind me until it be kind of light and I could see the, and see what they're doing and how. <clears throat> and now in a minute here come old Ted by me with his head held right in there and he is and windy. And he just dashed by that mule and here the others started to go around me. Well, I spurred and hit old Budweiser down the hind leg and a wave of wind. Right up that canyon just in the high gear. And you still couldn't see very much. And I was trying to get old Ted and the rest of them back and get them back behind me. And I imagine we had went three or four hundred yards. And now in a minute they just turned up the hill and all of them went to barking at the same time and really climbing. It w- and it was steep. <clears throat> well, I 
pile off of my mule and I grabbed for those t- two neck, that set of neck dogs to unneck them. And they got away from me neck. And after they got going up that hill, I had no show to catch them. And it wasn't no use to hollering at them or trying to control them because they, they were on a fresh bar track and they were going to go. And they was making so much noise they couldn't have heard you anyway. So here come Homer Gaither in a minute loping up. And he says, I had to check up down there and I couldn't keep up because uh, I was just about to run over some of those dogs. And I wasn't going to do that, so I just pulled up. I said, well, Homer, there they go. So we rode back into the canyon a little ways and was listening to Adam going up that mountain. And I said, well, let's rim back. I said, how's the best way to get up on that ridge, that high ridge and climb out this canyon? Well, he said, just back just a little ways. There's a kind of an old trail that goes up that says it's steep and hard. Take us quite a while to get on uh, top. I said, well, let's listen to them a little bit and be pretty sure they're going over the top. Well, I don't imagine they was up there. I don't imagine they were halfway up and we heard them catch that bar. Now, mister, the excitement run then because if you ever heard a bar battle, it went on. And I, I was uh, thinking about them four, them four fighting son of a gun's neck together and just could be vision of getting both of them killed just because they got away from me neck. And uh, I didn't neck dogs too often. Then I was uh, jumping up and down and uh, saying bad words to myself about myself for necking those two dogs that morning. But anyway, well, we just sat there to see what was going to happen because we couldn't do anything. This is going to take quite a while for us to ever get up there if anything happened. And I imagine this went on, this battle went on for at least 20 minutes or maybe longer. And uh, I could tell it was a real battle. And after a while, well, they started barking tree. <clears throat> well, this this hillside was a little kind of little ledges on it and it was so steep an animal couldn't a four-legged animal like a horse or mule couldn't uh, climb it so we got off a foot and up there we went well i run off and left homer gaither and got up to this tree and this was a big bird up it but it was early in the morning when old gaither got there well i said well <clears throat> Don't you think that's the bar that you want? That you've got the permit to kill? He said, well, I believe it is. And he said, we're going to take the chances that it is. But when we skin him, if it is, we'll find where he's been shot. And I said, all right. But he says, it's uh, the lights are four and it's early in the morning. I can't even see my sights. I want to wait here for a while. So we did. And just a little bit, well, six more dogs showed up. And that would make, uh, that would make 18 dogs. We had 12 and 12 had turned six loose to go bar hunting. And they heard those dogs treed and they came to them. And after a bit here, Clell come. Well, just a little bit after Clell got there, it got light enough. And he shot that bar and he shot him three times before he, before he hit the ground and he had him dead. But I was sure relieved when I got up there and I found these two fighting dogs. It broke their necking and they, they weren't necked together. It might have been an awful sad story if they'd have been necked together trying to fight that bear. But they had broke loose and I imagine they had a lot to do with that bear climbing the tree. So we shot it and then I rode on back to camp for something. Maybe I rode back to get a pack horse. I've forgotten what I rode back for, though, and everything had got quiet up there. And Benson come out and said, what is taking place? I said, well, Benson, I think we killed the old bar that was after. I said, we sure had a battle. 
And he said, well, how'd you kill it? I said, well, old Homer Gaither shot him three times. Well, he says, you know, as I was standing out there, uh, listening real good to those dogs treed, and I never heard a shot. So the, the barking of those dogs had just rounded out that rifle shot, three shots, and he never heard a thing. So that shows how much noise a pack of good barking tree dogs will make around the tree. Well, I got a pack animal and put a good pack saddle on him and went back up there. And Clell and Homer Gaither had uh, rolled and pulled and dug that thing down off of that mountain far enough that we could get him to get to him with a pack animal. And what I mean, that was a job of all three of us. Uh, uh, but we finally got him on the pack animal and packed him down to camp. Then we took care of all of our dogs and tied them up and Phil decided not to go lion hunting there for spending that much time there with us. <clears throat> so he agreed to help us. So we just sat down there and skinned that bear just as fast as we could. And we found out we was right and we had the right bear because he had definitely been shot in that several years before that in the hind leg when he was bayed by dogs. And that's one thing that kept him, when he was being run by dogs, that he was uh, so hard to hold long enough for anybody to get up inside of him. He'd already been shot once. And I Rip certainly felt proud then of the bear dogs that we had that did tree that bear because Homer Gaither says, I know that bear has never been treed by dogs before. And uh, so, that made, that made me feel good and proud of her bear dog. Which if a man's not proud of his dog, when, he, when they do get up and do real good work, well he's not much of a hunter and much of a hound man.